Early October, a Breeny Common Nature Reserve sees the western gorse still in full bloom. Unlike common gorse, which grows just about anywhere, western gorse is restricted to highly acidic heathy areas. That's why it's here at Breeny. It's also much smaller than common gorse, usually well under one metre high. One of the few dragonflies today is a male southern hawker on patrol. Below him on the water is a surprisingly large group of pond skaters. They were in a wide range of age groups, from small nymphs to fully grown adults. I just can't explain why they were assembling in this way. On the edge of the group, solitary adults were cruising around in the way that I expect them to. The members of the group were extremely active, constantly interacting with each other. All this was consuming a lot of energy to no apparent purpose, so why were they doing it? Up on Bobbin Beacon, the jays are busy searching for acorns. They're not having much luck. It's a really bad year, as happens now and again. Acorns are a precious commodity in short supply, and they're not the only ones looking for them. 30 years ago, you hardly saw a jay, just a brief flash in the distance. Now, you can stand right out in the open filming them, although I was using a telephoto lens. Back in September, I showed you the rowan berries, the first fruits to ripen. Now it's the turn of the hawthorn to lay on a feast for the local birds, especially the blackbirds. By the end of November, they'll be stripped bare. If they miss any, they'll soon be gobbled up by red wings migrating down from the north. It's not just birds that find hawthorn vital as a food supply. It's also the most important host plant for the hawthorn shield bug. This handsome beast is the largest of its kind in Britain. Throughout the summer, I'd been watching the nymphs gradually growing larger as they went through their developmental stages. By now, they've all turned into adults, spending their time basking in the early autumn sun. For any American viewers, I should perhaps point out that what we call shield bugs are known as stink bugs in America. That's a good name. The defensive secretions are really disgusting. While I was busy filming the shield bugs, I suddenly spotted a tiny fly flitting around on the nearby berries. It turned out to be a hawthorn gall fly, an Amoea pomunda. And what's more, it proved to be only the third time it had been found in Cornwall. This is just the kind of serendipity that turns up when you're filming. And that wasn't the finish of the story. Just an arm's length away, in full view, on a leaf, was another kind of shield bug. I immediately recognised it as a bronze shield bug, a species I'd seen many times before. Unlike the hawthorn shield bug, this is a predator. It speared a sawfly larva on its feeding tube, known as a rostrum. This is the perfect tool for extracting the unfortunate larva's body contents. See how the rostrum pulses as it sucks the victim dry. Although not the same species as the bronze shield bug's victim, this is what sawfly larvae look like when they're alive. This is one of several species that eat the leaves of willow. The defensive habit of curling the tail upwards over the back is typical of many sawfly larvae. As you can see, they look confusingly similar to the caterpillars of various small species of moths. But to the expert, they're easy to tell apart.
In marked contrast to hawthorn berries, those on the holly don't seem to be very palatable. They usually remain on the trees until well after Christmas. Note how the leaves in the upper part of the tree have smooth edges. The prickly leaves that we associate with holly are restricted to the lower branches. Black Bryony is the only British member of the mainly tropical yam family. Although its fruits look enticingly brightly coloured in the hedgerows, I've never seen anything eating them. As autumn progresses into winter, they simply shrivel up and fall to the ground. Late summer and early autumn is the main courtship season for the common orb weaver spider, Metellina segmentata. Most webs will have two occupants. That's because the male, top right, moves in with the female for long periods. If she objects, hard luck, the male's big enough and tough enough to look after himself. For long periods, nothing happens, they just sit there motionless. But when an insect blunders into the web, everything changes. See how the male is now busy wrapping this beetle in silk. He'll use it as a lure to entice the female into mating with him. But at the moment, he's not enjoying much success. The female desires the food, but not him. Unlike in many male spiders, he has absolutely no fear of the web's owner. Here, you have a good view of his six tiny forward-pointing eyes. He can't really see much with these. He lives in a tactile world, linked to the silk of the web. As they move around, all spiders constantly trail a silken thread behind them. Watch out for this as the female retreats back to her lair. In terms of sexual competition, this male has really hit the jackpot. While I was setting up the camera, he emerged as Victor in a fight with a rival male. Now he's busy wrapping him up in silk to act as a lure to entice the resident female. Eventually, the female's attention is attracted by all the shaking of the web generated by all these goings-on. But for the moment, although she comes closer, she remains just out of sight on the right. Finally, she rushes in for a brief investigation. But now she's hooked, so she quickly comes back. Stroking her constantly with his front legs, the male tries to win her over. But she's having none of it. She'd rather forsake her meal than mate with her uninvited lodger. But neither of them is willing to give up. The female still wants her meal, and the male still wants the female. So he keeps on stroking, and she keeps on running. And so that's the way it went until the light started to fade. And that's when I called it a day. Next morning, I thought I'd try and get some more coverage of the spider courtship in my garden, where they're common. Instead, amazingly enough, I chanced upon this field mouse, gnawing on a plant stem. It just sat there chewing happily away while I set up the camera on its big tripod no more than two paces away. I was particularly surprised to see it because normally this is a strictly nocturnal animal. Autumn is the time when the dot bug deserts its normal host plant and moves on to a variety of other food sources. These adults are feeding on a bracken stem. But at this time of year, they're also commonly seen on brambles. The rather slow, jerky, hesitant looking movements are very typical of this species. Over much of Britain, ivy is now the only plant still in flower. And the only butterflies now on the wing are those about to go into a late hibernation, such as the comma. They're busy stoking up with their final meals before the long winter fast. As I mentioned in September, when at rest with wings closed, the comma looks just like a shriveled dead oak leaf. This becomes vitally important during its winter hibernation.
The only other butterfly in evidence towards the end of October is the Red Admiral, which seems quite strongly addicted to ivy flowers. Way back in April, I figured the drone fly as an example of the first insects to start visiting the springtime flowers. Now, with the summer slipping into history, it's perhaps the last insect to hang on into late autumn and early winter. Although in Cornwall, it can usually be seen in any month of the year. While filming these, I heard a tap tap tapping sound coming from under the nearby trees. This called for a quick look. It turned out to be a nuthatch hammering on a hazelnut, trying to open it to reach the kernel within. The bird had wedged the nut in a crevice in the bark so it wouldn't move while it was being assaulted. Despite battering away for some time, it didn't seem to be working, so it moved the nut and had another go. We're now getting to the time of year when many different kinds of birds, including these goldfinches, are forming into flocks. They've long since finished off all the available bird seeds, so they're now foraging for a variety of different foods. At some stage, they may get together with various other species of birds to form a mixed flock. This is a common phenomenon during the winter months, lasting through till springtime. Most of us can enjoy seeing this beautiful wood pigeon preening peacefully in the sun, but maybe not if you're a farmer who's trying to grow a crop like kale. In hard winters, huge flocks of pigeons can strip such a field bare. For me, there are two sounds that epitomise the end of autumn. The mournful winter song of the robin and the cawing of crows. There goes the robin. This year there's been plenty of autumn rain and so the streams are full and in spate. This is my cue to spend most of my time looking for fungi. One of the first to appear and the easiest to spot is the yellow brain fungus. It can be particularly common on gorse stems as seen here. It doesn't actually get its food directly from the gorse. It's parasitic on another fungus that forms very thin, often almost invisible crusts on the bark. The yellow brain fungus is extremely widespread and common. In Cornwall, there's always a pretty good chance of running across one of the world's rarest fungi. It's October the 28th, and I've come here to show you this very rare fungus. It's called hazel gloves because it looks rather like fingers gripping a branch, usually of hazel trees, but also sometimes blackthorn or willow. It's a hyperoceanic species mainly found along the west coast of the British Isles and also in similar places in small areas of Europe. Like the yellow brain fungus, the hazel gloves is also parasitic on another species of fungus, this so-called glue crust, Hymenocate corrugata.
Breeny Common Nature Reserve is a really good place for fungi. In late October, there are often large numbers of blackening brittle gills. One of the characteristics of this fungus is the way the gills turn red or orange when they're handled. They do this within a few minutes. It's always worth looking around for an old blackened rotting fruit body because these are often colonised by these so-called piggyback fungi. There are often two species present, the powdery piggyback mushroom on the right and the silky piggyback mushroom on the left. However, most of the dead black fruit bodies remain uncolonised. Many fungi only produce their fruit bodies at irregular intervals. Conditions have to be absolutely perfect. And despite lots of theories, we don't actually know what they are. These large, fleecy milkcap fungi on the Red Moor Nature Reserve seem to buck that trend. They crop up reliably in this same place year after year, no matter what the weather has been. Like many fungi, milkcaps form a symbiotic relationship with tree roots, in this case, oaks. Both partners, fungus and tree, benefit from this close association. Like most mushrooms and toadstools, the underside bears numerous gills. It's from these that the zillions of spores are released. Note the bleeding milk, which gives these fungi their common name of milk caps. On this particular day, just a few strides away, there were hundreds of wood hedgehog fungi. This is one of a relatively small number of fungi in which the gills on the underside are replaced by spines. It's from specialised structures on these spines, rather than on gills, that the spores are released. Fungi are one of the few organisms that can digest the cellulose in wood. One of the most blatantly successful of these is the sulphur tuft. It often occurs in thousands on some old stumps, where it's an important promoter of their eventual decay and final disappearance. In some species, the presence of the fungus mycelium actually stains the wood around it. The classic example is the green elf cup. Years ago, the stained wood was used in a form of marquetry known as Tunbridge ware. This used natural colours rather than paints or lacquers or stains. It was used in ornamental boxes and other small objects. Now, let's just fast forward into November. I came down here a few days ago without my camera and I found a fungus that's as blue as my coat. Here we are. This spectacular organism has recently been given the name of cobalt crust. It's quite local in Britain, mainly in the west, and Cornwall is its chief stronghold. In some of the hedgerows on Bombing Beacon, almost half of the sticks are covered in it. As I said before, it's as blue as my coat. Up until the year 2000, it was only known from 11 one kilometer squares. The current total stands at 342. We've come a long way since April. On Bodmin Beacon, the purple moor grass is fading back to yellow, where we came in. Winter's close, and I'm ready to pack up my cameras. Making these videos has taken me to so many outstandingly beautiful places. I've been privileged to film a host of fascinating and highly photogenic wildlife. 
Not surprisingly, so often, I just kept on thinking, it just can't get any better than this. So, I wrote a song about it. As you'll probably notice, I decided not to ruin everything by actually singing it myself. So, here we go then. How much better can it get? Just can't. 